The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our fourth Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson and I'll serve as the host for today's event. This series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport and around the world via Zoom. We'll be offering an additional 12 lectures between now and May of 2023, spaced about two weeks apart. We have uh, indicated that people who participate in at least 70% of the lectures can receive a certificate of participation. And that includes whether you watch them here, you watch them on Zoom, or you watch them on YouTube. We will use the honor system, so keep track of your attendance. And towards the end of the series, we'll ask you to identify those who've attended the 70% and are interested in that certificate. So we'll make that happen uh, sometime next year. Uh, a announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. I want to alert you to a very special lecture that is not part of our INS series, but is open to our Zoom audience. On Tuesday, 15 November 2022, NASA astronaut Captain Sonny Williams will provide a lecture about NASA and space exploration. It'll take place 1830 to 2000, so note that change of time. And our PAO office will put out the uh, Zoom connection information just prior to that event. So uh, it promises to be a very, very interesting uh, discussion of uh, what's going on in the world of NASA. Looking a little bit further ahead on Tuesday, the 21st of November, Commander Andrea Cameron will speak about global climate issues. So on with the main event. Please feel free to use the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll get to as many uh, questions as we can at the end of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Holmes. Jim is one of the most prolific writers at the college and is known by almost everyone in the maritime security business. He holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the college, and he previously served on the faculty of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. A former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991. He earned the Naval War College Foundation Award in 1994, recognizing him as the top graduate of his class. His latest book, A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy, is a primary selection of the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. I'm not exactly sure why, but former Secretary of Defense James Mattis considers him troublesome. So we may wanna go into that today, I don't know. His talk this afternoon will explain why it's so hard for the US Navy to prevail in strategic competition or warfare in the Pacific even though it remains stronger than its competitors. I'm pleased to pass the baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Holmes. Thanks, Captain Jay. Uh, Captain Jay Fay, he, he actually failed to mention he was my very last gloss in uniform here, here in the uh, fleet seminar program back in the, back in the mid 1990s and the, a good boss he was. So it's a, this is one of my favorite types of events. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you've all turned out either here or out in the ether, whether it's on YouTube or on Zoom or whatever you might be on. I want to talk, to, as, as Captain Jay indicated, I want to talk about I want to talk about how hard it is to calculate the strength of a Navy and why it is harder for the, for the stronger Navy to amass superior combat power at the place and time of battle, if there is a battle, in this case, in the Western, in the Western Pacific, where we think 
the primary theater of lies given the rise of China, uh, threats to Taiwan, all, everything that we've seen China, China doing in recent years in the past decade since the ascent of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, this, gosh, exact, almost exactly uh, a decade ago, November 2012. So let me do, let me dive right into it. This is this project goes back about uh, to about 2010 when Robert Kaplan, whom you might be familiar with, he was uh, he was guest editing an, an, an issue of Global Asia, a, a, an international relations uh, magazine uh, headquartered headquartered in South Korea, and he asked he asked me and my friend Toshi Yoshihara to at, to write an essay explaining how to calculate the strength of a navy, and it's a, it's it's there are many different ways of approaching it. And it's, it's it's a surprisingly hard thing to do to calculate which for which force has the has the has the upper hand in a given place at a given time. As our as our friends in Joint Military Operations Department tell you, it's all about concentrating superior force at the right place at the right time. Whoever has the most firepower is likely to win. So pr pretty pretty straightforward thing. Very hard to do. So yeah, so this is uh, this is something we've been at for quite a while. And sometimes it leaves you feeling like Rick Grimes. From the Walking Dead, because you will find it hasn't been too bad this election season. Today, of course, is election day here in the United States, but it, but oftentimes, especially in presidential election season, you get the you get these ideas about the Navy, about the size and the configuration of the U.S. Navy, and no matter and they're they're not all untrue. Many of them have a little bit of the of the truth, but the problem is that people will tell people, especially in policy debates, will take these idea these ideas. And they will re represent them as a true measure of U.S. naval power, when in fact they're only telling part of the story. And if you shoot them down, you go out and uh, just stand on a stage like this, or, or go out and print and debunk one of these ideas. It doesn't matter because ten more people will come right behind them, just like zombies. Shoot all ten of those down, a hundred will come until you've exhausted your ammunition, and, this, and the bad ideas are still there. So I hope that I will recruit all of you to, to join my, my hearty band of zombie fighters when you hear people uh, do, doing this sort of thing out in public. My agenda for, for this afternoon is pretty straightforward. I, I want to talk about strategy. I'm a professor of strategy. We talk a lot about strategy here at the War College. So, so I want to look at the tenets of U.S. maritime strategy just briefly to see what we are trying to accomplish in the Indo-Pacific. It, it turns out, if we, look at our, if we look at our aims, our strategic aims in the Western Pacific, our successive administrations from both from both parties have seen a 60-40 split between the United States Navy and Marine Corps and Coast Guard as about the right way to, to, to balance forces between the Atlantic and the Pacific theaters in order to help us gain the aims that, that, that we see fit to pursue in the Western Pacific. And uh, after we think about that, after we think about after we think about how to how to how to judge the combat power that the, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and, and the affiliated joint forces bring to bear. At that point, at that point, we will flip it around and look at the red team and look at why it is so hard to prevail in an away game, which is all we play in the United States military. We're in North America. We're trying to manage events in the rimlands of uh, Western Europe, East Asia, South Asia. Pick your, pick your favorite, favorite rimland. That's a really hard thing to do from thousands of miles away. It's an expensive thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. And you also have to think about how the adversary might th try to thwart your aims, given its home team advantage. So let's let's turn it turn it immediately to strategy. There is you, if, if you want to get a, a glimpse of what U.S. maritime strategy is all about, a lot of times it's a, it's right out there on the internet. You can you can Google U.S. maritime strategy or cooperative strategy for uh, 21st century sec, uh, maritime security, something like this, and you can you can dig up a trove of documents like this, including including the one from the left, which was which actually was unveiled almost exactly 15 years ago on the stage where I am standing right now. This is the Bush administration's cooperative security for 21st century sea power, which I will use sort of as a proxy for the for the for the later ones because I thought I think it stated U.S. maritime aims very clearly. Uh, in, in fact, I would say probably more clearly than certainly the the one to the middle, which is the Obama administration's update of the of the, of the cooperative strategy, and, probably, and arguably even even better than the, the, the uh, Trump administration's December 2020 advantage at sea maritime strategy, which which you'll see to the right there. But nonetheless, I, and I, I think it's actually in a sense it's it's kind of a heartening thing that you see administrations from both from both parties more or less see the strategic environment and the ways to manage it in very similar terms. I think that I think that's actually a, a consoling thing, considering all considering the lack of the lack of consensus we see so often in Washington these days. I think I, I think I would reduce the the tenets of U.S. maritime strategy to these three. And again, drawing drawing on the 2007 document, it's all about it's about all about mounting 
what the Pentagon calls credible combat power at times and places of our own choosing. Gee, chiefly, chiefly in the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean, given, given the strategic configuration there. And also the Persian Gulf, that was back in 2007 when of course Iraq was still, was still raging on. We, had, we, had, we were in Afghanistan and so forth. So I, I think you've seen a relative de-emphasis on the, on the Gulf in the favor of the, the Indian Ocean. And the, and, the, and the Western Pacific, but, none, but nonetheless, you get the idea. It's mostly, it's mostly the southern, southern and East Asian periphery that, that we were worried about. The uh, 20, so 2007, it was kind of an interesting document. It was a very cooperative document, as the title indicated. It was all about alliance building, as indeed it should be. We can't, we can't accomplish much in the world without allies. But nonetheless, even in this, even in this very, very cooperative sounding document, nonetheless, you found a couple of nuggets like this. The United States, uh, reserves unto itself the right to impose local sea control in any body of water on the pl on the planet Earth at times and places of its own choosing, preferably with help from allies and friends, but alone if need be. That's a, that's a pretty expansive vision if you think about trying to uh, trying to project uh, naval and military force thousands, across thousands of distance in the face of hostile resistance. Also, and this was this this occasioned a lot of buzz when when the strategy came out. It also declared that the United States sees itself as the chief custodian of a of a multinational custodian of the system. We will work with our allies and partners to preside over the what we now call the rules based international order, which is nothing more than the order that was put in, put in place in 1945 after World War II, built on freedom at the sea, built on built on free trade, and all of the things that that have made us prosperous and our allies and friends prosperous, including including some of our adversaries like China over the years. So, so the, I mean, these are very expansive aims. What kind of resource base do you think you have to, de to dedicate to actually accomplish these things? Well, the Obama administration in 2015, this is one of my favorite strategic documents because it, it, actually, it actually put even a little bit sharper edge than the 2007 maritime strategy did on this. On page one of that document, I, I remember sitting in my office up in, up in Hewitt Hall and I, and I opened that document up the day it came out and I saw this, it's all about freedom of the seas. That means that that's a very strong statement that the United States and its allies and its partners see that we, we see freedom of the seas as the cornerstone of U.S. maritime strategy. This is the idea that the seas belong to everyone and no one. And it, it's, it's in direct contravention to, to what China has tried to do in the South China Sea, which in, this, which in essence is to assert state ownership, sovereignty over 80 to 80 to 90 percent of that body of water. So strong statement, strong statement from the other side of the political aisle that we are going to be defenders, chief defenders of, of freedom of the sea. So kind of, but again, a very ambitious and a very strong statement. Go into the Trump, to, and you see, it's, it's as I said, it's very similar thinking. So you see people sizing up the strategic environment and what to do about it in very similar terms. The Indo-Pacific is the, is, is the Defense Department's priority theater, suggesting that other theaters now take lesser priority. We don't have a new maritime strategy out of the Biden administration, but if you if you parse the national security strategy, which is newly on the streets, and then the national defense strategy, it, it's very much very very much the same type of thinking as well. So, if we have these expansive aims, how do we match up resources with them in order to defend those aims and get our way in the world? Is a, is a sixty forty split here in the United States Navy? Is that enough to, to prevail against an adversary defending its own home turf, as China will be inevitably uh, in any Western Pacific conflict that we might engage in? So, that, that, which brings us to talk, to talk about fallacious ideas, potentially fallacious ideas about measuring sea power. As, as we see these guys uh, trying to batter down and, and get the hardy band from the walking dead. The first idea that I would commend unto, unto you that, uh, that you run into a lot, especially in the elite press, is the idea that who has the Benjamins wins? Whoever spends the most on, on defense and national security automatically is going to win should you get in a fight. And I mean, that's, it, it seems to make sense. I mean, oh, oh, so let me move ahead. There it is. I fooled myself there. A lot of times during election season in particular, you'll run into, this is, this is from during the 2016 election cycle, but a lot of times you'll run into these routinely. The idea that the United States spends more than the next X powers combined, and therefore it's going to steamroll, it's going to steamroll any potential adversary. It dwarfs the rest of the world in military spending. Pretty strong statement. And this, I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite 14 at this point, but I think, but I think it's it's the next 10 or something like that. So the logic the logic expressed in this graphic uh, seems to still apply even to this day. But think about it, but think about where all that money goes. Except trying to manage the world from North America 
it costs you. It costs you a lot. This is USS Zumwalt, our latest, our latest and, and greatest uh, guided missile destroyer, sitting over at Pier Two here in Newport in 2015 on the way on the way south to its commissioning and its uh, and its entering service. Each we have three of these, each of which runs about four billion dollars. So somewhere somewhere slightly north of four billion dollars. Last time I checked. How right, about, about our, uh, our latest aircraft carrier, USS Ford, which, which is packed with, uh, with fancy technologies like electromagnetic uh, catapults and recovery systems and, and elevators and whatnot. And it, fi finally, it actually, it actually did pretty well in these shock trials, but we seem to have sorted out a lot of the technological difficulties, which were many. That runs about uh, $13 billion. And that's without putting people on it, without putting stores, ammunition, airplanes, or anything on it. That's just the haul. Again, that's a, that's, a really, that's a really pricey bit of, of the defense budget, and it really cuts into that superiority in spending that's implicit in such graphics. These, are, these will be a, a big part of the air wing of the future at the F-35C stealth fighter, now making its, way into, making its way into the fleet, each of which runs something like $105 million. So I'll multiply that by the size of a couple of squadrons. You're talking about another couple of billion, a billion dollars that goes into the cost of that, of that vessel. How about this one? This is uh, th this is the Columbia class submarine, the next generation uh, ballistic missile nuclear submarines that we re rely on to anchor nuclear deterrence in the U.S. The Ohio the, the Ohio uh, class that's still that's still doing this function entered the entered service while I was still in uniform, which has been a long time ago at this point. These are, these are being built in part right in, on here right here on Narragansett Bay. If you walk out and look to the left past the Newport Bridge and to the north a little bit, that's Quonset Point where sections of the hull are actually being constructed and then fabricated down, down the road uh, in Groton, Connecticut and in, in, uh, in, in Huntington in Newport News, Virginia. That runs about, uh, we, we, want 12, we want 12 of these and they run about $9 billion a piece. Last, last I checked with the Congressional Research Service. So that's what, that's what, these are big ticket items. And again, they cut into that with that seeming superiority, that, that vast superiority in defense spending. Or how about manpower costs? I don't know if you have any uh, Top Gear fans uh, from the BBC from years ago. I think I mean, th these guys were always, they were always prevailing on this guy, the Stig, a professional race car driver, to go out and test uh, different supercars. He's not, I think this is a metaphor for American spending on, on our soldiers and sailors and aviators. It, 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 this is not low cost labor. It has been estimated that uh, the United States it cost the United States to put about eight to nine times what it cost the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to put a soldier, sailor, or airman in uniform. So again, that's a, that's a real difference maker for China, and, and it really cuts. I think it cuts that uh, differential in, in defense spending down to size. So if you add that all, add that all. I think, it, I think it's a fallacious to say that to us, or at least to assume that he who spends the most wins in armed conflict. But the next, the next stuff, the next fallacy, the next zombie that we encounter on our on our quest is this one, which I which I would suggest is uh, it, it amounts to who weighs the most wins. Why do Why do I say that? This is a, and this this is Robert Kaplan, whom I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, one of one of the greats in the field of of international relations and and defense studies. In fact, he was standing right here about five a little bit over five years ago, and he said this: the United States. The United States Navy is by far the biggest Navy in the world. The Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, is the 12th largest Navy in the world, if you want to look at it that way, which seems like kind of like a mysterious statement. I don't think it's, it's, it, this would be kind of lost on, uh, on uh, Captain Jim Fennell, former uh, Pacific, U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, Intel chief, who published a, a, a nice book through the China Maritime Studies Institute here at the college, his, cha his chapter contended that China would probably have about 500 ships by the year 2030, whereas we're struggling to, to, to get over 300. So numbers of hull, numbers of hulls seem to seem to suggest that Kaplan is wrong. In fact, in fact, the, the, the most recent uh, uh, Pentagon report on report on Chinese military power more or less agreed with for now. China has about 355 ships, our aspirational number today. It's building towards about 420 by 2025, and, and approaching and approaching 500 by 2030. So, where do you get this? The idea that the United States Navy is by far the biggest, the biggest navy in the world. This was this was just in an article uh, a few weeks ago from another one of the greats in the field. Uh, this is Michael Hamlin from the Brookings Institution. He points out, and he's trying to debunk the Chinese Navy. It has a much touted navy, but it's really only. And this is where he gets to the point. 
it's, it's aggregate tonnage. How much that fleet weighs is still only half what the United States Navy weighs. It, it's, so we're talking about the tonnage of our hulls, how much water they displace. And that's, I mean, I, I mean, again, that's a, that's a useful data point, but does it really tell the whole story about relative power? And I would say absolutely not. I mean, so what? I mean, it does, does the biggest force always win? Well, I mean, if I mean, if you take it to an absurd extreme, if they, if if, if relative tonnage is is the the critical determinant of combat power, this is one of the most formidable warships in the world. The Emma Maersk, five hundred fifty thousand tons out, out out of Denmark. It's five times it's five times the tonnage of the USS Ford, which I showed you before. This is obviously a, this is obviously an absurd, absurd example of or basically a counterexample to to this idea that tonnage is all that matters. I mean, think about it. Does Coach Belichick look for, look for this guy when he's trying to figure out how to get how to, how to get the Patriots blocking so the blocking schemes right so that Mac Jones doesn't get sacked all the time? Probably not, but he's uh, that would be that would be the that would be the biggest and bulkiest guy that he could probably find with the, with his big old belly. Now, now, if the metaphor is this, if we if if this if this if this sumo wrestler, a big beefy guy who packs an, an enormous amount of combat power into a big into a big frame, that now, now that's useful information, especially if he can sling a sling around his opponents and give him a wedgie. If we can give China's navy a wedgie, and we're a big if we're big and bad, and that's a good thing. But again, but, but again, I think I think this idea that tonnage is all that matters is, is simply misleading. He who weighs the most need not win. Uh, the, the next idea that I would that I would give you would would go it would be closely related to that, and this would be the idea that the that the number of hulls in the fleet is what matters. And I, and I think that of course this is the Great White Fleet from the, from the from the age of Teddy Roosevelt, which uh, circumnavigated the globe. I think that's a, 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 an apt metaphor for this idea. You'll see during election years in particular, from one side of the aisle, the idea that, that numbers of holes do not mean much, and from the other side of the, of the aisle, that, uh, that numbers are just about everything. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Generally, people on the right uh, talk about numbers of holes being extremely important. People on the left talk about that, too, and they, they downplay the importance of numbers of holes that constitute the fleet. Here's a, just a... a this is a, a, a talking point you always oftentimes encounter in this debate is the idea that the United, the United States Navy is now smaller in numbers of hulls than it has been since 1917. Actually, 1916, when the Wilson administration authorized the construction of a Navy second to none. And it's actually true in historical terms. You can, you can look it up. There, we, have, we, have, we, have a, we have fewer ships in the fleet than we did back a, a century plus ago. Interesting. But and, and again, you, this is something that you, you normally hear from the Republican side of the aisle, including from uh, Senator Wick, Senator Wick, uh, Wicker of Mississippi, of Mississippi, rather a big, a big shipbuilding state. This, we, we now have the smallest navy since World War One. And by the way, we're building down the, the Biden administration. The, the, Biden, the Biden Navy is talking about cutting numbers of ships in the coming years, from, from the from the current about 296 all the way down to 280 before starting to grow again. So the. So this, so this argument would be even more compelling coming from, from the Republican side of the aisle. You, you get a lot of pushback, obviously, from the, from the other side, which, do, which, which doesn't want to be cast as weak on defense. This was President Obama's uh, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, also from Mississippi, who, who pushed back against this idea. He basically said, ships today are much more technologically advanced. And, there, and therefore, you can't, you can't assume that you can make a linear comparison between numbers of holes then and numbers of holes now. And that makes sense. I mean, I don't think you, I don't think the Great White Fleet would stand too much, uh, too much. Uh, it wouldn't stand too much of a uh, chance against the U.S. Pacific Fleet today because it would never get in range to actually to cut, cut loose with its big guns. So superficially, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But again, but 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 if the but if but if ships have moved on, technology has marched on. At the same time, so 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 is the threat environment. It is it is it is vastly more threatening out there than it would would have been in 1917. So. Certainly, certainly, the Great White Fleet never, never had to face off against uh, J-20 stealth fighters or, or all the other array of weaponry that China can, can put out there in order to make things tough on us operating in their backyard. So, I, I, I actually do, I actually do see value in this in this back and forth debate between the two sides. But again, I think those are both very, very partial measures of naval power. They're part of the picture, but not, but certainly not the entire picture. The next, the next, uh, the next idea that I would go over with you is the idea that. Sea power is all about ships, and it seems and it seems to make sense, doesn't it? I mean, think think about think about when you when we watch a movie on 
Midway or whatever from the 2019, Shiv, the, the idea would be that sea battles only, only pit navies against navies, and therefore that's the critical determinant of sea power. Or, or you could go back, or you could go back, something that we study a little bit to, here in Newport to this day, and think about the Battle of Jutland during, during World War I, when the, when the British Grand Fleet goes out and takes on the, the German high seas fleet in a sea battle remote from land-based defenses that cannot affect the outcome. It's a purely naval battle. And I think that's a, that's a lingering image that, sh that shapes this idea that ships are all that matters. But we know, it, it, we, know we know that we live in an age of long range precision firepower. And, the, and, the, and that if the battle takes place within reach of that firepower, that's gonna, that's gonna shape the outcome of, of an encounter at sea. You have to factor that stuff in as well, or else you're gonna have a false picture of the true balance of naval power. Because, we, because, because again, sea power is about more than navies at any likely battleground today. Yeah, think about think about the array of, uh, of weaponry that the China's PLA has built, shore-based aircraft, uh, shore-based missiles and so forth that can reach out scores, if not hundreds or even thousands of miles from China's coastline to add their firepower to, to any naval engagement that, that happens within reach of that firepower. At that point, at that point, you have to you have to count a unit of combat. It, it doesn't really matter where a unit of combat power on the scene comes from, whether it's from a ship or a shipborne aircraft or from a land-based aircraft, missile, or whatever the case may be. That you have to factor in the aggregate combat power that the two contenders can bring to bear. For example, China apparently has, has perfected the world's first working anti-ship ballistic missile. The D, this is the DF-21D, which the Pentagon has, estimates has a range of about 900 nautical miles from China's coastlines. And it's able, it's, able, it's able to fire against moving vessels out at sea. So that's, I mean, that's, that, that changes, I mean, that really alters the calculus when you, pit, when you try to measure one Navy against another and, the, and uh, Fortress China can bring this additional firepower to bear. The DF-26, this, this is a more recent uh, family of anti-ship ballistic missiles, which the Pentagon estimates as having a range of about 2,000 nautical miles off China's coastlines, past Guam, towards, uh, towards Wake Island and Midway. If you, if, you think about it, if you think about having to start worrying about enemy firepower 2,000 miles before you get to the battleground, I think that, I think that uh, suggests something uh, serious about naval power in this age of long-range firepower. Here's a, here's a picture to, to depict what I just said. This comes out of CSIS in Washington, which is a one, if anybody uh, specializes in this stuff, they, they always keep a wonderful uh, a table of graphics depicting the different mis missile inventories of various contenders around the world. And here's how, here's how they show the, the, the envelope within which the DF-21D and the DF-26 uh, actually operate. Man, look at that, look at that outer, uh, that outer range arc. That overshadows Japan. Taiwan, South China, all of the South China Sea, Bay of Bengal, all of the Arabian Sea. And this is without putting a ship in the air or a ship at sea or an aircraft in the air or a ship at sea from China. If they are able to reach out and touch, reach out and touch hostile forces uh, from, from Chinese coastlines, that's a serious thing that we have to contend with and something that the Pentagon is very worried about today and rightly so. But it's not, but it's not just shore-based stuff. As the, as the PLA Navy has made it itself into a modern ocean-going fleet, which looks very much like we would expect a modern Western Navy to look, it's also, it's also constructed in a, a flotilla of light missile-armed craft such as conventional submarines and such as uh, uh, surface patrol craft, such as, such as the Type 22 Hobe catamaran, each armed with eight anti-ship missiles and suitable for doing picket duty, uh, basically fanning off offshore within, within more or less the same waters uh, over, overshadowed by the, the anti-ship ballistic missiles. And again, to make things very difficult for the United States Pacific Fleet and associated joint forces to make their way into the Western Pacific in time of conflict, unify with forces already in the region and, ult and ultimately reverse aggression. So the idea, the idea is to use this kind of, this kind of thing to keep, to keep us from joining forces and overpowering the, the adversary. And it's a, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a logic, uh, if, you, if I were advising the PLA, I would have urged them to do something very much like this. I like this sort of lurid graphic out of CSBA, another Washington think tank, because it does uh, graphically depict how, as you close in on, Asia, on Asian coastlines, you come within reach of more and more stuff, and you come within uh, reach of, of greater harm from, from the PLA, as well as the surface fleet operating in conjunction with that. It's not just that. And it just, there are a couple of other things you hear about in the news a lot. 
China's uh, fortified manufactured outposts now fully militarized in the South China Sea, an expanse that China cares about very much. And again, something else we would have to deal with should we get in the scrap with the Chinese. Or think about, think about the gray zone forces. When I started giving a, a version of this talk 10 years ago, I used, to, I used to put this slide up and it was always a laugh line because I showed fishing at fishing vessels and I depicted them as the vanguard of Chinese sea power. But if you think about what China has tried to do in the South China Sea, it relies heavily not only on the fishing fleet, but on a maritime militia operating within the fishing fleet that, that essentially fans out into other nations' uh, exclusive economic zones and tries to stake China's claim to sovereignty over those waters. They're backed up by the China Coast Guard, which is backed up by the PLA Navy, which is backed up by uh, shore-based PLA forces, uh, creating a, a, a really wicked problem for, for Southeast Asian states, such as the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, pick your, pick your favorite contender. So again, if it's, a, if it's an implement of sea power, whatever can, whatever can shape events at sea for China is an implement of sea power. The fishing fleet's a big part of it. So we, just, just to, to uh, sum this one up, I would just uh, I would just offer that the strongest fleet need need not win. It is the strongest force, and again, it's all about aggregating all the capabilities available to both contenders at the time and place an action might take place. As, as Einstein would remind us, you have to be very careful about counting stuff up because not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. So they, so so take all this stuff with a, with a degree of salt. And when you hear these. Uh, these ideas out there in the debates. If you sum up these partial ideas, you get to, you get things like this. This is a Professor John Mearsheimer, one, another one of the greats in the field. That's why I put these guys up here because these are very, very reputable commentators. He's been he's been at this forever. He stood on this stage in, in the mid '80s and critiqued the U.S. maritime strategy of the Reagan administration. He takes all these ideas and he, he this is what he comes up with. He essentially, in his most recent book a few years ago, he said this is what he said. Essentially, we are ten feet tall. Here's how he leads off. He says, China does not possess significant military power. And this is long after the PLA has launched into the, into the buildup that we see culminating today. And here's the second half of the sentence. Why does he say that? Its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. Well, I think we've established that you can have the, the overall uh, superior force, but trying to, trying to mount a superiority of force in somebody else's uh, uh, backyard is a really hard thing to do. The, those two things just are these, they simply don't, they simply don't uh, reinforce one another. It's possible for the inferior power to win. If you survey history, about a third of the time, and the inferior force is actually going to prevail. And figuring out how to do that, uh, figuring out how to do that is, is something that is deeply ingrained in China's political and strategic culture, reading, reaching back to the days of Mao Zedong uh, and, and even earlier in, Ch in Chinese strategic history. So he, from, from this, he draws the conclusion that, ch that China would be making an enormous mistake to pick a fight with the United States. I hope he's right, by the way, but I don't, but I don't think he is. Because, which, which brings us to, to, to the last part of our agenda for this afternoon. Away games are really hard. The visiting, team, the visiting team is always going to have to contend, much like, much like in college football season or basketball season is getting underway uh, as we speak. You know that there's always going to be advantages that go to the home team or the home court, the home court uh, defender. To, to shift gears from sports, though, this is a, this is Klausowitz, somebody somebody who who you uh, resident students are going to spend a lot of time with. He, he actually explains this logic that the, that the lesser power can win if it does things to make itself stronger at the time and the place it matters. Let me break this down. Well, I mean, he said he basically, so this is sort of the motherhood and apple pie, apple pie part of it. It's best to be strong, go to Gold's Gym and work out every day. Be stronger than your adversary on the whole. So that's, a, and that's, that's certainly true, even if hard to accomplish. But he goes, and so if you want to do that, the best way to do that is to keep all your forces together so that you have the best chance of being stronger when it matters and where it matters. But he also, but he also goes on, on to advise us, even if you were not the stronger contender on the whole, by some of the measures that I, that I went through. It, again, it is possible to be stronger even without that absolute superiority. It's possible to make yourself stronger at the, at the, at the point of conflict. And if you can do that, if you can do that over and over again, win a series of tactical engagements, you can ultimately wear down your opponent, make yourself stronger relative to the, to the opponent, and ultimately hope to go on the offensive and win. That's a, that, that's cause of it. That's a take from, uh, from 19th century Prussia on, on, the, on, the, on what we're trying to do in the Western Pacific today in U.S. maritime strategy. 
So again, here's a, in modern terms, this is how I would sum it up. Think about the old the old bumper sticker we used to say we used to see around New England. So to borrow from that, I would say a contender can be globally inferior, but but also locally superior. And if it is, it can hope to accomplish its goals without ever without ever overcoming that, that stronger foe as a whole. Let's transpose all, all, all this onto the theater that uh, that we're operating in. Courtesy of our friends at our friends at Google Earth. This, this is, of course, is the Pacific Theater, which, which you can barely see any land in. Uh, but uh, but the, this logic of battling zombies actually applies here. Obviously, we know that we know that, you, that zombies can cross water. So we have so, so we do have to contend with with trying to transpose these ideas and come up with a winning strategy in the Western Pacific. Well, this is a big theater. I see I see a number of you from the theater out there. You know that you know this very well, as as well as many of us who have served in the theater in the Pacific have done as well. This is a map from uh, Richard D. Harrison, dating from the Second World War. I love it. I love it because it should, it depicts Japan's outer defense perimeter. This is what Japan was trying to enclose and essentially dominate and make into a co a co prosperity sphere, basically for the benefit of Japan. It's a big theater. I mean, think about all that water space, trying to, trying to police all that water space with a compact, a very good, but, but also complex fleet like the Imperial Japanese Navy's fleet. So they had, they had massive ambitions, but there are bigger theaters in the world. Another, another map from, from Richard Deeds Harrison. Here are the waters that, here are the waters that uh, China worries about most. The, uh, the solid line encloses the, the, the waters inside the first island chain which runs from Northern Japan down through Taiwan, Philippines, and on around to enclose the South China Sea. And the dotted line, the dotted line shows the waters within the second island chain, which runs through, through from, from, again, Japan down through Guam and terminates uh, near New Guinea. That's a, that's, a, that's a very ambitious claim. But, there, but again, there are, bigger, there are bigger theaters. What do you think the theater for, of endeavor for the United States military is in the United States Navy? We pretty much have irons in the fire in every theater on the face of the earth. This, imply, this implies that uh, the PLA is concentrated near potential scenes of action in the South China Sea, Taiwan Strait, East China Sea, or, or pick your favorite uh, potential battleground. But we're scattered. We're scattered all over the place. So we have Charlton Heston acting as Moses, telling us that the highest and simplest law is to keep concentrated. Politically speaking and strategically speaking, that is a really hard thing to do for a global power like the United States. And why is that? Because I tell you, anybody, especially any of you who have served in the Pentagon, you know that every single every single commitment around the world, whether it's a whether it's a, in the northern hemisphere, south southern hemisphere, wherever the case may be, it has a constituency that thinks that that is the most important commitment on the planet, and it's going to fight. It's going to fight tenaciously to 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 make sure that that commitment retains its place and its claim on resources within U.S. strategy. It's really, it's really hard to, to, to do what strategy requires you to do and, de and demote some, uh, some priorities for the sake of what matters most, which, uh, which successive administrations have told us is the Western Pacific. But nonetheless, there's, so there's, something, there's, there's something about being a big globe-spanning power that inhibits you from doing that. We have to confront the tyranny of distance, as I've mentioned already a number of times, as, as you know very well. And yet, yet another political map from World War II. Just, and I just love this one because it, it shows exactly what routes our, our Lynn Lease craft had to, had, to, had to traverse to get supply, supplies to allies before the United States entered the war. But again, just, 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 just geographically, it's just a really imposing map. It shows, it shows not only how long those routes are, but how potentially contested they are, given all the places that they have to traverse for those, for those ships and aircraft to actually reach their destinations. It's simply hard. I mean, it's just hard to project power across that sort of distance. It requires it requires a big a big array of bases, uh, logistics capabilities of all types, whether it's whether it's ships or aircraft or whatnot. And this is this is very very expensive, and it's also subject to, uh, to to hostile action to try to cut us down to size and prevent all the all that mass from flowing into the different theaters. In fact, I, I always I always see this image in my, in my mind. This is a, this is a depiction of the inverse squares law. Uh, that's what we encounter in basic physics, which, which which depicts nothing more than the idea that a radiation source, when I if I transmit light or whatever the radiation source may be, it drops off. The, the intensity of it drops off by the square of the distance. It drops off like a rock. To me, that's a metaphor for uh, for trying to project power from the, from North America 
to the REM lands of Western Europe, East Asia, South Asia, or pick your favorite pick your favorite zone of potential conflict. You have to have you have to have boosters in the form of logistics bases and everything else that that enables forces to actually make their way across that uh, that vast distance of sea and sky. So, so Clausewitz could tell us so that what the highest and law of highest and most compelling law of strategy is, but it's really hard to actually obey that law. And it's very, very expensive to do that as well. And we haven't even come to it. We haven't even come to the, to the adversary. The enemy is not a potted plant in strategy. The enemy, is, the enemy has as many brain cells as you do, as much desire, if not more, to win than you do. And it has options by virtue of being on, on home ground and then being able to avail itself of that sort of thing. I always see, I always see uh, Paul Van, or General Paul Van Riper's face when I think about this. He was, a, he was the quintessential red team. If you want, if you want to test yourself against a serious adversary in, a, in an exercise environment, this guy, this guy is the one you want to do it. Uh, back in the, in the year 2000, he actually played Iran in a in a war game called Millennium Challenge 2000, and he was allotted the resources that Iran would enjoy if facing off against the U.S. Navy uh, carrier task force operating in the Persian Gulf. He was obviously vastly outmatched in terms of resources, just because that was the configuration of power. But he was so inventive in how he used those resources that he was actually able to sink that uh, carrier task force and really put a lot of egg on, on the Navy's face. So we, the Navy did what, what we always do, or what we tend to do when, uh, when things don't work out in war games. They changed the rules so that the Navy could win. He resigned. But anyway, you get, you get the idea. If you, you, can, you can actually take a lesser inventory of resources and use them well in order to defeat a stronger force. And I think Diana, this is a logic that uh, that China has taken on hold. I mean, think think about the great Bruce Lee trying to go into a hostile dojo and actually trying and actually trying to to actually survive and and thrive in that in that dojo in fists of fury. This is sort of this is sort of the, the strategic challenge before us in the Western Pacific. Think about that. Think about the the the, the home field advantage. I mean, it's, it's, this this is kind of a silly example. This is Texas A and M University, which claims to be the home of the twelfth man. Well, think about think of what what fans do to the visiting team. They try to they try to make as much noise as they can, uh, in, in order to confound the, the signal callers and, and and to cause penalties and other and basically just make mayhem for the visiting team. My uh, University of Georgia this weekend uh, reportedly the decibels were exceeded that of a of a jet aircraft taking off. I mean that's a, that's that's the twelfth man in, in in operation. It's not just that you can do things to try to you can try to dis, to distract the visiting team. All of your manpower is, is right there in the theater. All of your resources that you can concentrate to do things to confound your adversary's strategy. There's no rules either. I like this. I like this WWE example. It's it because because if there's a referee over over warfare and international relations, he's probably about as effective as that referee standing there watching this poor guy getting tossed out of, out of the ring. There's nobody, there's nobody regulating the size of the teams to keep the teams equal in military power, just as there's not here. It, it, in fact, it behooves you to try to overpower your foe and, and fight as unfairly as possible. And that's, a, and that's, a, that's an advantage that potentially goes to the home team. Bottom line, the enemy gets a vote in your strategy, and the enemy is going to cast it against your success, simply because that's the nature of the contest. As I, as I draw to a close here, I would, I would be remiss in a lecture on maritime strategy, not to mention our second president, Alfred Thayer Mahan, probably the, probably the most uh, influential maritime historian and theorist of all times. He actually, in one of, in one of his later works that we don't read with, with our students here, he actually gives us a, a formula for thinking through these problems. And he brings together material aspects, he, bring, he brings in risk management, and he brings in geopolitics, which I think this seems like a very simple, simple formula that he's sketching for us, but I think it's extremely powerful and, and it can help us solve some of these dilemmas that we've talked about by reviewing uh, the material tonight. Well, first of all, the, sort of the material dimension, think about size, think, of, think about uh, tonnage and numbers of ships and so forth that, that, that I went over with you earlier. Well, it says, obviously, if I'm sizing a fleet to go out and have a fight with my adversary, I need, I need a fleet that is great enough to basically contend with the largest force it's likely to meet in battle. So again, so that, that, these would be all the material indices such as, uh, such as fuel capacity, weaponry, sensors, and all that kind of stuff that, that make it possible for one force to, to engage with another with a, with, a, with a reasonable chance of success. So again, there's a lot of risk management. Part of this goes to the personality of the commander. How much, how much risk are you willing to bear in an action against a peer rival? So again, material, material factors, comparing forces, and then, and, and then figuring out what's your risk threshold. 
how much, how, how much military power, naval power do I need to give myself a reasonable chance of success against an adversary? This was, I mean, this was a, this is, this was a, a problem that the Royal Navy back in, back in its heyday uh, contended with uh, pretty successfully with a, via a two, what they called a two power standard. They basically said, if you look back, if, if you, if you scoop back in, in uh, European history, typically, typically France and Spain will gang up against Great Britain uh, in a fight. And therefore the Royal Navy should be equal, equal in numbers of hulls, gun power and so forth to, 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 those, to those two powers, assuming that they would be the most likely adversary. And at that point, if we're equal in numbers, well, we're Great Britain. We, we, we do seamanship and tactics every single day. We will trust to the human factor to make, to make the difference in an, even, in an even fight. So this gives you, gives you some ways to, th to think about how to, how to balance risk. What's the, to, to me, that's the, this is the most, most, uh, most potent word in this entire formula. How do, you know, how do you know what enemy force you're likely to meet in action? There's, a, there's a lot, there actually a lot in there because you're asking yourself how much of your enemy's military and naval power the enemy is going to commit to a fight at a place at a particular time at a particular place on the map. This is a, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a, a problem that our that our uh, that our own navy thought about very intensively during the during the days of of of, of Mahan and Teddy Roosevelt and all those uh, geopolitics minded people around the turn of the last century, and they and they they realized that. And they, they, they thought the United States Navy, it needed to be big and brawny, but it didn't be, need to be as big and brawny as you might expect. Because the most likely adversary, the Royal Navy, was becoming more and more friendly as the turn of the century came on. Britain had interests all over the world, so therefore the Royal Navy was scattered all over the place. And therefore they concluded that at a time when the, when, when the British had about 200 capital ships, they figured that the United States Navy could, could get by with about 20 capital ships because that was the largest force that Great Britain would send into the Caribbean Sea, which is what we mostly cared about back in those days. So again, the lesser power can be the stronger power at the places, at the places that matter to it most. And that's, why, that's, what, uh, that's what Mahan's trying to, trying to get at. If I'm sitting in Beijing and I'm facing out against uh, and, and looking at the United States and its allies, whether it's Tokyo or Australia or, or, or pick your favorite ally, how much of those forces are those powers likely to band together in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, or some other contingency? And that, that becomes the benchmark of an adequacy for the People's Liberation Army. So again, we can, we can, we can take uh, Professor Mearsheimer's logic and say, yes, the PLA might be still inferior to ourselves, but does, the, does this formula actually, actually provide a lot of consolation because of, the, uh, because of these factors? So just to, just to wrap this up before I open up for Q&A, how do, if, if we try to solve all this, try to try to integrate all these factoids together and come up with something that's actually meaningful, you obviously have to do the Mahanian thing and obviously try to I mean try to try to figure out what the battle power each contender contender brings to brings to bear at the right place at the right time, whether it's through a surface navy, submarine force, land-based air force, or missile forces, or so forth. You have to try to you have to try to sort sort that out. You have to figure out the likelihood of, of, of each side. Can, can, committing a certain percentage of its of its military power to a fight. China cares China carries a carries a great deal about what happens in the South China Sea, obviously the Taiwan Strait. You have to ask yourself to, to the extent to which the United States cares about contingencies in those same places, given that we're so far away. But uh, so opportunity costs and direct costs obviously are going to come into come into come into play as well. And again, you have to the, the element of risk management. You, you simply you simply can't you simply can't uh, d discount this. I mean, if you if you think about this array of weaponry, anti-access weaponry that that, I, that I've shown you just briefly here tonight, in, in a in a sense, they can they can they can basically the Chinese can basically say to President Biden, "What is, it, what is this worth to you? If you think that you're going to lose a lot of the Pacific Fleet or your or your U.S. Uh, joint forces in the region in an afternoon, your global standing depends on 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 those forces. At that point, do you want it enough?" Do you actually want it enough to pay the cost and the opportunity cost of victory in the Western Pacific? And that's a, and I think that's really what uh, Chinese maritime strategy is all about in peacetime. China wants to win without fighting. And I think it's manipulating these variables uh, to great effect in recent years. So bottom line, this is, the, this is really the question that we have to try to solve. Who wins when a fraction of US forces goes up, goes up against the entirety of a hostile force? 
whether it's the Navy backed by, uh, by an Air Force and a strategic rocket force. And that's a, that, that's a really difficult thing to, to solve, even if you even if ship for ship, plane for plane, missile for, for missile, person for person, you are still superior, as indeed I think we, we still are. But nonetheless, the logic of strategy suggests that this is a still a really difficult problem. So when you when you hear all these when you hear uh, things like this from uh, and during the during these debates and election season in particular, have a uh, mTOR. Let the buyer let the buyer beware. So be 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 a, be a critical consumer of ideas like this. And I think and I think we'll go to a far towards uh, clarifying these debates and coming up with some some collective wisdom and doing things right in the world. And with that, I think I I think I will open up for Q and A. Thank you kindly for your attention. And I'm going to wet my whistle because uh, fall pollen season is upon us. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Lefin Gomadan, Nitin, India. Uh, is this an analysis of uh, Navy versus Navy in isolation or of an open war? If it is of an open war, how uh, are the navies going to influence results on land? That is one. And yep. next is you covered all the tangible elements. Uh, when it comes to a Navy versus Navy comparison. How about intangible or qualitative elements like combat experience, experience yeah. or doctrines and uh, tactics which are evolved over a year over years of combat experience? How do you uh, kind of plan to bring them into this comparison? Yeah, so, so basically so basically you asked about the alliance factor and then about the human basically about the human factor. And I, I think that's did, did I did I get all that? Uh, the first one was regarding uh, whether it is a Navy versus Navy in isolation right. or how the navies are going to influence uh, results at, on land. And second is regarding the combat experience and the tactics and doctrines that where U.S. holds advantage. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great point. It's, it, it's when you in one, one of the key one of the key themes that we always uh, stress here at the War College in our, in our courses is that uh, I mean, obviously, alliance, the alliance factor. This is crucial. If we can pool our combat power with 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 close friends and 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 adversaries, then obviously we are we are increasing that combat power, and that has to really come in. That has to come into the equation as well. You can also when when you talk about solely navy on navy, though, you can also think about joint uh, joint operations, operations between bringing together armies, navies, marines, uh, or whatever whatever implement of military might you have at your disposal. You can think of those as you can also think of those as as, as an alliance of a type. Between the between in our case the U.S. Air Force, Navy, uh, Marine Corps, and even the Army in the Pacific, all of the all of the joint forces have embraced their maritime role in the in the in the uh, Western Pacific, which I think is a beautiful thing because we're going to need all those all the services if we're going to actually solve uh, solve all these problems. So, which I, and I think to, I didn't get into the to the Marine Corps what what, what the Marine Corps is doing, uh, especially under under General Berger, the current Commandant since uh, 2019. He's been pushing the idea of uh, basically. Uh, what, what, mounting what he calls expeditionary advanced base operations. That, that means shuttling small small bodies of, of Marines from island to island, armed with anti-ship missiles, armed with sensors and so forth, to basically help the fleet to defend itself and deny command of these waters to the adversary. If we can, get, if we can deny command of the, of, of this, of the Taiwan Strait to China, uh, more or less permanently. That's basically what we need to do. That's what that's what Taiwan needs to do. So, and you can use land forces to actually uh, to actually make that happen. So, so so in a sense, I'm saying that the logic that I apply to China also uh, also could be put to work for us. And we can and we can also try to take uh, command of those waters. And so again, deny the adversary control and, and win control for ourselves. So, I, so I, that's sort of the joint and the and the alliance dimension. As far as the human factor, I, I think it's a, and especially this year with the war in Ukraine, I think that's I think that's really thrown that uh, thrown what you're saying into 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 sharp relief because we we, we actually you know we know that Russia was is, by material measures is probably about ten times the uh, ten times the adversary that the, that Ukraine is, and yet. Obviously, the material dimension, as as Western powers have put uh, have put material in there, whether it's HIMARS or or pick or pick your favorite weapon system. Obviously, that matters. But again, the human dimension matters. Ukraine is defending its own home turf. It's it's, it's been trained by Western forces since 2014 when it lost when it lost to Crimea. So yeah, it's so it has morale effects going for itself, doctrine and all that all that kind of stuff. And I think the, and, and it seems like Russia has has been deficient in this. So again. So sort of like the sort of like the Royal Navy banking on seamanship and gunnery and so forth to make the difference against uh, foes that are not 
from a human standpoint that uh, that uh, that proficient. Yeah, you, you have to you have to bring that into mind. I think, we, and if you ask me, my, my gut feel from working with all of you every day is that, is that we're still ahead, well ahead on that. But again, we're also facing off against a, a significant material mismatch until we get our stuff together, which I think we're starting to do. But it might be a few years. Another question here in the auditorium. Yes, sir. If you could use your microphone, please. That way, uh, our folks on Zoom. Oh, yeah, also I, yeah I can hear you, but uh, people on Zoom won't be able to. Yeah. Sir, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm a captain from uh, Italian Navy. Uh, during your lecture, you used so many times the word, the verb to win. But my question is, what do you mean with the verb to win? Well, I mean, that's, a, that's something you always have to. That's something you always have to take in mind. Well, if you're going to get in a fight, what are you actually trying to accomplish? I mean, we're we're still debating. We're here. What are we? What are we? Nine months into the Russo-Ukraine war, and we still don't know exactly what uh, President Putin means by by actually winning there. We're we're still debating that. It, it, when I when I talk about winning, I'm talking about winning a naval engagement, and then and then linking that to strategic to strategic goals. So I, I mean, I suggested to you, I suggested to you that well, I mean, for China, for China, it's it's pretty simple. If you will flip it around and look at it from the red team side. What China want? What China wants is to slow us down, to enfeeble us before we can unite our forces in the Western Pacific. If it can do that, if it can, if it can take the the ESD or take the energy out of our counteroffensive, at that point, it's given itself time to get across the Taiwan Strait and, uh, and to try to subdue the to try to subdue uh, uh, the the islands the the islands KMT government. So. Pretty, it's pretty straightforward to see what China wants. As far as, as, far as winning for ourselves, I, I was talking in an operational and a tactical sense. If we get it, if we, if we, can, if we get into a fleet tactics uh, situation, what do we have to do to actually prevail in order to defeat that strategy? Get our forces, get our forces into the Western Pacific, unite the U.S. Pacific Fleet with the Seventh Fleet and other forces, Third, Third Marine Expeditionary Force or, or whatever, and, and, and actually and actually prevail and keep China and keep China from uh, from actually doing what it wants to do. We are very much a status quo power in the world, and, and even in the Western Pacific, we are trying to defend the system as it as it has existed since 1945, and that mostly means denying China what it what, what it wants, and trying and trying to get it to, uh, to trying to somehow get it to to abide by the rules set, set up set up back then to it, to which uh, China has actually acceded for the most part, but now seems to, now that it's strong seems to seems to think it doesn't have to uh, have to have to abide by it anymore. So. It's a strategy. I'm talking about a strategy. Of what what Clausewitz would call a strategy of negative aim, where, where, where you mostly just wanted to, to, to feature your adversary's aims and keep things the way they are. Gary, do you have any uh, questions from the Zoom audience? Uh, we do, uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Holmes, for that uh, excellent lecture. Uh, so, uh, summing up a couple of the questions that came in, um, what kind of uh, ships or types should the U.S. Navy uh, be pursuing. Do you agree with the the current approach? And what about like the regional middle powers? And uh, what naval strategies should they pursue in relation to China? Uh, are, is there a role for uh, smart minds that can be deployed by stealth bombers, or or how about like you know the U.S. agreement to for sub technology to Australia? Is that is that something that is helpful? Yeah, there's a. I seem to be getting multiple part questions. You all are very academic crowd. I'm getting lots of multiple part questions. Uh, the, the first one is uh, so as far as what the United States Navy should be pursuing. I think. I mean, I, th I think we should be pursuing what we are pursuing. But the fact is that we that we also need a whole lot more of it. What can I mean? Time is not our on our side in the Western Pacific. What can we What can we procure and what can we do fast in order to multiply our combat power? A big part. I mean, I mentioned uh, General Berger and the and the idea of uh, expeditionary advanced base operations. I mean, that's a, that's about uh, that's about dispersing forces among islands on on land. But you can get, you can complement it with some of the things I showed you with with Western counterparts to some of the things that I show you that China has deployed. And there's been a lot of talk about this uh, over the past decade, in particular, about uh, taking uh, large numbers of small hulls, mount, basically mounting ship anti-ship missiles on them, and having them fan out in waters that we would like to to, to defend and to keep China China from controlling. So, if, I mean, if you we, we know that we know that our, our our major shipyards are taxed to their limit trying to maintain submarines, build aircraft carriers, doing doing all this high end stuff. But if you can if you can reach out to smaller shipyards, for, for example, on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, or if you can reach out to shipbuilders in uh, 
or the UK or, or Korea or, or, or Japan, if you can get them to build these small craft and if we can militarize them, and if we, get, if we can do that in large numbers, at that point, you're starting to harness some of the logic of what China's done. And again, and again, you've, you've, you've made things hard on the adversary. If you, if you take that map of the Western Pacific, and if you look along the first island chain, the entire first island chain belongs to, 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 US, to US allies, friends, or partners. And if you, if, you, if, you actually can, if you actually control those islands, and if you, and if you actually put Marines or Army troops on the islands and, and all these smaller scale things uh, in the waters, blocking the straits through those islands, you have now confined a China's Navy and merchant fleet to the western, to the western Pacific, or within the China Seas, rather. And you've actually, you've actually denied them access to the Western Pacific, thus putting the economic hurt on China and thus giving yourself a lot of military options. If you, can, if you can basically seal off that access to the Western Pacific, at that point, your heavy forces, your cruisers, your destroyers, your aircraft carriers, and so forth, they can operate in the backfield in the Western Pacific and try to evade those, all that anti-access stuff while plugging up any points where the PLA actually manages to break through. So that's, a, that's sort of a very short way of, uh, of explaining a, 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 a sort, of a big, sort of a big project that, that, I, that I think we've embarked on. It's, it's access versus uh, it's basically anti-access versus anti-access is what is what we're what we're sort of proposing. As far as middle navies, yeah, you, I mean, I think I think that all these smaller scale things, I think you should absolutely avail yourselves of them. I, I'm not sure I would call Japan a middle a middle rank power because I, because I think it's more than that. But it oh, during the Cold War, it it took advantage it took advantage of its fleet of conventional diesel electric submarines to do a lot of this sort of thing. The uh, the Japan Maritime Self Defense Self Defense Force would would send submarines out to lurk off these strains and basically constrain uh, communist communist Chinese and say and Soviet military movements not only, not only north south along along the Asian seaboard but especially east west through those straits. This is, so so this is a, this is a, this is not a new thing that we're talking about doing. You mentioned you mentioned aircraft uh, dropping and dropping uh, precision minefields. That's happening a lot. This is a big thing that the the U.S. Air Force has been doing. Uh, whether it's dropping uh, quick strike mines, uh, you also see pictures of, of uh, bombers fire, firing anti ship missiles, close air support aircraft uh, practicing attacking uh, uh, island island strongholds like in the South China Sea. So yeah, a lot of these lower end things are things that are within reach technologically, but especially budget wise of middle powers. And I think that's I think that's a, that's a way to, that's a really, a really way to think about your own maritime defense because. A big part, of, a big part of what the United States would really like to see is that our allies and our friends can take care of their own, uh, their own security to the maximum extent possible. And at that point, you have a division of labor in which the United States can go out and do uh, more, more, more ambitious things in China's background or in, in its in its backyard. Well, I think one of the goals here at the Naval War College is to get people to think differently and challenge the conventional wisdom and whatnot. And I don't think I've ever seen a better presentation done on this stage that set up the ideas that everybody believes and then consciously knocked them down one by one. So brilliantly done, doctor. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming today.